This is a preview of my Python backend course. If you'd be interested in this, check out the link down in the pinned comment or in the description. Hey everyone, welcome back to episode two. This is going to be a continuation essentially of episode one, which makes sense. You should probably watch these in sequence. However, we're going to talk a little bit in more detail of some of these different tools and talk about some we haven't really talked about yet. Now, I promise this whole course isn't going to be conceptual, just the first video and the second video, and in video three, the next video, we're going to get hands-on and set up our development environment. So endure with me for one more episode as we talk about some more concepts and get a better understanding of web development, starting with the deployment process. So when you code, how do you go from coding locally to getting that code out on a server somewhere? Let's talk about the step-by-step -step process. So the very first thing is you code locally. You type in on your machine, you make some changes, they look good. So you commit those changes and you can make multiple commits. Now, again, as mentioned in the previous episode, the source control management that we're gonna be using, Git, is decentralized. So we can commit as many times as we want on our local machine, but those are not automatically going to go to a centralized location like GitHub. If we want them to be up on GitHub, we need to push those changes from our local machine to GitHub. Now, if you want, you can have it automatically take your new pushed commits and deploy those to a server. And that process is usually known as continuous integration and deployment. CI slash CD. Once it's deployed on a server, you can check against that server, make sure it's working right and everything's good to go. So that is the entire process. Obviously, it's going to take a little bit more time to actually do all that, but that is the ideal. Automatically triggering a deployment is not a required step. If you decide you don't want to do that process, then you would just take your files and you would upload them directly to AWS Elastic Beanstalk or S3. Additionally, you might not want every commit that's pushed to the centralized repository to be deployed. So there's two different things you can do about this. The first one is only deploy when you manually tell it to deploy. You can still do the automatic processing. You don't have to upload any files directly, but it's just going to wait for you to say, okay, deploy. Alternatively, you can just do the automatic deploys without any click of a button, but only do it on a certain branch. So when you get a better understanding of Git, you understand that there's different branches you can use. So you could have a main branch and this is going to be the code you deploy. And then you might have a feature branch, you know, maybe you're wanting to add user authentication. And once that's done, you can merge that branch into main and that merge into main will trigger that deployment and it'll update the deployed software. So let's take a second to go through a visual of what this process is gonna look like. We code locally on dev branch, we commit the changes, we push the changes to a centralized location such as GitHub, we merge the dev branch with the main branch, and that new code on the main branch is going to trigger a deployment. Once that deployment is done, we can confirm the changes on the deployment server to make sure everything looks like the way we expected. So the deployment server is matching the behavior that it was our local host environment. Now, if you're working in a team environment, it's gonna be pretty similar, just a little bit different. The main difference is instead of automatically merging that code into main, you're going to submit a pull request to merge the dev branch into main. This will need to be reviewed and once approved, it can then be merged into main and the same thing is gonna happen where it automatically triggers a deployment and you can confirm those changes on the deployment server. So this can all be done with AWS code pipeline. Now here is a good summary of Code Pipeline. It's a fully managed continuous delivery service that helps you automate your release pipelines for fast and reliable application and infrastructure updates. This solution uses Code Pipeline to create an end-to-end -end pipeline that fetches the application code from code commit, builds and tests using code build, and finally deploys using code deploy. Now the term pipeline is when the output of one step goes in as the input to the next step. So looking back at this words, you can see that we first get the code and that's going to go into the build process and the output of that is then going to go into the deploy process. That's why it's called a pipeline. It's a step-by-step -step process where it has to go in order. So the different tools, you can read about some of those there, but this code pipeline kind of summarizes all of it. Now, Code Commit, it's an alternative source control service that will host Git-based repositories. However, you can also use GitHub, which I prefer. You just have to integrate with your GitHub account. Now, the next big thing I wanna talk about in some more detail is databases. We are going to be using databases a lot. 
It's an essential component for any website or application. Databases give us the ability to persist data or save data, and that's going to exist between visits. So when you log into a website, it might say something like, hello, Caleb, it remembered your name. That's because that information is stored in a database. So the application software doesn't have any memory. Anything that you want to exist beyond that visit, you need to put in a database. Because of this, databases are gonna be used for essentially any information that is important, stuff you want to keep. Now Python actually ships with a database, so it makes the process very easy, and that database is called SQLite. You can get started with SQLite in 0.02 seconds, but it's not suggested for every use case. Now don't get me wrong, SQLite is amazing. It's a fabulous tool to get started with, but it's often considered a little bit more lightweight maybe not for super large scale web applications. It is often given the term an embedded database. And what this means is that the SQLite software is included with the software running on that application. It's embedded in it. So it's going to run on the same server as our web server. This is handy for simplicity and we don't have to have a dedicated server that's separate that runs a database and then we have to worry about connecting the two, but it's not suggested for all use cases. Where an embedded database shines is if you imagine building software that's going to be deployed in many locations, like let's say you're making a smart refrigerator. That refrigerator might need to store some information locally, so you could use something like SQLite, and that can be deployed to a million different fridges. In web development, it's different though, because you have a centralized hub, a centralized database, and every single visitor is going to talk to that database through your backend. So an embedded database, although it can work, is not really designed for that structure, that architecture. It's really good when you want to deploy the same software in multiple locations. But for websites, we only really have to deploy that software in one location, and multiple clients are going to visit that location. That is the client-server architecture. SQLite actually talks about this, so they clearly say that SQLite is not for everything, which is cool to hear them saying that instead of just trying to sell it to everybody, because it's really fabulous for embedded devices and Internet of Things. And it can even work for websites with low to medium traffic websites, even getting 100,000 hits per day. It can also be used for a cache, preventing the hit of an enterprise database. So maybe it'll save some effort, reducing latency, not having to go talk to a dedicated enterprise relational database. However, as you read on, and you can look through this web page if you're interested, or you can just read it here, there are solutions when a dedicated relational database server is going to be better. And it's really for client server applications, as I mentioned. When your application gets bigger and you want to distribute the load across multiple servers, you now have two or more clients that might be trying to modify the same database info, or you might have multiple backends that talk to this database. That's not gonna be really possible with an embedded database that's on a single web server. Same thing if you have high volume websites, you don't wanna be using SQLite or very large data sets or high concurrency. So. Here's a checklist for choosing the right database engine, and you can read through that as well. But the TLDR of this is that SQLite will work for small to medium applications, but as you go bigger, you want to look into something else. So if you can't use SQLite, what do you end up using? I would suggest Postgres for what we are doing, but you could easily swap this out for another relational database like MySQL or Oracle or SQL Server. And doing that swap is gonna be easy because we're going to write our code in a way that the software doesn't have a ton of information about what database we're using. It's abstracted away. And that's one of the benefits of having these smaller services is that you can swap out different components and all the other services don't need to know about that as long as the interface of communication stays the same. And we're going to do that using an ORM or an object relational mapper. It'll abstract the database away from us. So you could use Postgres or you could swap it for something else with very little change to our code. So that's pretty awesome. Some use cases for SQLite that I wanted to call out is for education and training. It's completely free easy to get started with, and it can act as a stand-in for an enterprise database for demos or testing. So you could use SQLite locally and then deploy to Postgres. 
Another good use of SQLite is an alternative for writing to disk. So instead of using these things here, you could use SQLite, which can be faster than the file system. Similar concept with caching. You can use it for caching to prevent having to hit your enterprise database, which could be faster, reducing latency, or save money. So that's a summary of the relational database world and our approach for this course. What about the NoSQL world? Well, if you want unstructured data, the two that I would recommend are DynamoDB, which is inside of the AWS world, or MongoDB. Both these are fairly similar in the way you think about it, but these will allow JSON-like data where you have documents of key value pairs that can be even nested data. So you could have something like the person's user information, and then you could have their job and have more information about their job. And then inside of that, it would have the company and more information about the company. Basically, nested data is very easy with these key value pairs that can have nested data. So for the NoSQL route, I'm gonna be using DynamoDB, but you can also use MongoDB if that's a tool you are more familiar with or will be using in your career. But since we're already inside of the AWS world, we're going to use DynamoDB and we're going to talk a little bit about how to understand the cost of DynamoDB and how to architecture your data properly to use DynamoDB to get its full benefit. Just because something is considered no SQL doesn't mean you don't have to do any planning and can just throw data in there. You need to think a little bit ahead. You need to think about your indexes and how the data is going to be used. Now, I also like DynamoDB because it is serverless, so we don't have to worry about provisioning any of the hardware and DynamoDB automatically spreads the data and traffic for the table over a sufficient number of servers to handle the request capacity specified by the customer and the amount of data stored while maintaining consistent and fast performance. Essentially, it does all the magic for us behind the scenes and we don't have to worry about it being slow or maxing out some server. And there is a free tier of DynamoDB so you can get started with it very easily once you're inside of AWS. Now let's talk a little bit about our development environment. Whenever you get a new job, you're gonna spend your first f forever, like a week or two or longer, just getting your development environment set up and getting in sync with all the other developers. And if you are working on your own, you need to be a little bit careful that you don't let your guard down too much because there are some things you should try to avoid, such as working with your production database on your local machine. Yeah, it's a lot easier to do this and in some situations it's fine, but a better idea would be to have local databases that you can test with and you don't have the risk of accidentally deleting some important production data or screwing up the database. Messing up production data is bad, so don't do that. So to fix this, you can have a copy of this database. It could even still be inside of AWS or wherever you're hosting your database. You can just have a deployed production database and a deployed testing or local database. So that's one option, just having basically two different databases online, or you can have an actual download of whatever database you're working with, such as a locally downloaded version of DynamoDB or a local version of Postgres or SQLite. The way you can say which database you want to connect to is with environment variables. This can allow us to store sensitive information on our server instead of in our source code. So here's an example, we could say export password and set that equal to A, B, C, one, two, three. And then what we can do is we can see that value by saying echo dollar sign password. And we get the value ABC123. Or on Windows, it's going to look something like this set password equal to one ABC123. And then echo percent password percent. And these will just last for that terminal session. So if you want them to persist, you'll need to do something to make them stay in the computer, which we'll talk about that soon. But Following these concepts, you can have the environment's variables on your local machine have the username and password and all the connection information to the database that is used for local testing. And then on the deployed software application, you can have environment variables to the production database. So that way the environments act the same, but you're using different environment variables to connect to different databases. That's one way you can do this. There are multiple ways of doing this. So you don't necessarily have to use the environment variables. For example, you could just have an if statement where if development use this, else use 
something else, and then you could just change some flag if you're on your local development. Another important reason to try not to use the production database locally is because these databases may contain sensitive information. You know, this could be PII, personal identifiable information or something like that, where this is information about people, you know, maybe their address or their credit card numbers. These are the things that you don't want even yourself to have access to so easily. So that's the first thing when it comes to environments. We can use the environment variables to connect to different databases depending on which environment we're in, either local or deployment. In addition to the environment variables, you also need to make sure the software that runs your application is the same on your local machine as the deployment machine. So this is done with the requirements.txt. That's where we list out all the different software dependencies we need, and we can make sure those are all there so then when we deploy, that server will download all those dependencies and the application will have the same exact behavior in deployment as it does locally. Now a key ingredient here that a lot of people overlook is virtual environments, which we're going to be talking about. And this will basically give you an environment to say which versions of all these different software dependencies you have for your website. So this will allow you to have, let's say you have multiple websites on your local machine. One might be using a different version of a dependency. So we can use that virtual environment to say, hey, these are the exact versions of the dependencies we need. That way when we deploy or work on another machine or working with different people, everybody can be using the same exact versions and get everything to work consistently. So we want to, in all cases, try to avoid the it works on my machine problem where you know we might have it working on local, but as soon as we deploy it breaks or it works on my machine locally, but not my coworker's machine locally. We don't want that to happen. All right, so that was just me rambling about some different ideas of what we wanna talk about in this course. Hopefully it was a good overview and introduction. So we got the concept stuff out of the way. In the next video, we're gonna talk about setting up the environment so that we can start building our backend applications. Thank you for sticking with us so far. See you in the next one.